three students we have with us tonight are among the most critical, not to diminish any participation in the journal. Um, everybody who adds, adds significantly. But we have Bree Juries, who is our editor-in-chief. And Bree will be speaking both about the past and present of the journal, and also one component of it, which she now oversees, which has to do with the more editorial uh, textuality. So op-eds, occasional pieces, event reviews, things of that sort. Uh, Quinn Kane joins us as well. Quinn is here representing the prose components of the journal of a more creative kind, at least within the traditional organization of creative writing <coughs> media, so fiction and nonfiction both. And McKenna Christian as well, who is our managing editor this semester. McKenna is here and will be speaking about um, poetry and some translation features we've been pursuing this semester in conjunction with the Languages and Literatures Department. Um, so, some really exciting stuff. And without further ado, I will let them take center stage, but please join me in giving them a round of applause for everything we've done. Thank you, Dr. Black, for your unwavering support. Um, the Humanity Center has been a patron of us for about a year now, and without them, I don't think we could have accomplished half of the things that we've done, especially in such rapid succession. So thank you so much, Dr. Clack, Wendy Villa, uh, Dr. Hasselbeck, your unwavering support just means the world to us. Um, this is crazy. <laughs> uh, doing a panel is something that I don't think we ever thought that we would have the authority to do, um, especially as an authority on beauty. Uh, when Dr. Or, uh, sorry, Professor Malekian actually approached us with this last semester, he was um, taking over for Dr. Black's role while Dr. Black was on sabbatical, said, hey, you guys are doing a forum. And he said, okay, um, what's it about? The idea of beauty. And uh, I was thinking to myself, like, do we really have an authority? on beauty? Um, no, no way. Beauty is a huge, abstract um, concept that has just gone through the ages and is subject to culture and time and just where you're at. But um, actually we do because <laughs> we, uh, the, the Alcala Review was originally founded as a um, basically as a platform for uh, the Cropper Creative Writing Contest. Every year, uh, the Cropper Contest is held with support from Dorothy Cropper in memori uh, memorial of her daughter, Lindsay J. Cropper. Um, Lindsay was a writer here and unfortunately passed away, but um, they established a creative writing community within the English department, and from that it's flourished into readings from amazing, incredible, um, accomplished writers, and it's been really inspiring, and also encourages students to submit their own works, and then those works are judged by the accomplished writers that come in, and it's just a big thing. So, um, after a couple years of the Cropper Contest being in place, some fantastic minds came together and said, hey, we need to publish these works, give these students a bigger platform. So. Uh, in fall 2015, um, I was just perusing the USD English website. I had just declared my English major, was really excited about how to get involved, especially excited that I was leaving my business major, and, <laughs> and I just saw an open call, who wants to start a literary journal? Jumped in, and uh, the first editorial board was myself as uh, I believe I was marketing director and, and poetry editor. Uh, Natalie Earnhardt was our editor in chief. Miles Parnig, fiction editor. Brandon Ryder, nonfiction editor. And we were really small, like it was just us, and we were just ideas flying off the handle. What, what is this going to be? What are we going to do? Um, we didn't judge the first works that were published, and it was actually published originally online. I believe that we still have the archives of those online on our. Uh, website that is to be um, furthered in the future. Um, but then the following semester came and we said, all right, let's print something. Let's put something together. We found um, an amazing artist by the name of Danny. Her last name is escaping me right now. But Danny, she's an artist and she photographed her graphics and her um, sculptures and stuff and just put together some really interesting work. That's that yellow journal that is moving around right now. And 
we liked that journal a lot because it was weird. <laughs> it was un it, like strange things are in that journal. Um, they're also juxtaposed with works that we chose as students. For the first time, we had the authority that I was talking about. Um, were we necessarily looking for beauty? No, I think we were just looking for what is what is good. And I know goodness is going to eventually be touched upon with this Humanity Center series um, next year. But we were um, looking for things that really resonated with us. Like what, what specific to USD's campus could sway us and move us? And also, what is the um, lasting impression of having something in print, you know? So, um, further, or to uh, moving to the present, we, uh, we went through the submission process, or we've gone through the submission process, editing process, publication process, about one, two, three, four. This is going to be our fifth time. This is going to be our fifth journal being published in May. It's really huge to have so many physical manifestations, a culmination of beautiful, beautiful work. Um, and they're going to speak more to that, but what we wanted to share with you today is a sneak preview <laughs> of the new journal. You guys here, the select group, are going to see what we have in store for you. So you'll see behind me, um, this is a photograph by our uh, spring feature photographer, Lauren Camellis. Um, and she works a lot with double exposure work, Photoshop, to create some really interesting images. And what we let our feature photographers do, first there's an open call on campus. We say, hey, um, give us your photos. Give us 10 of your best photos. Email it to our Gmail. <laughs> then we go through them, we pick a select, you know, three or four, and then we say, all right, give us a full portfolio. Also put it on a theme. We want you to choose a theme. Lauren gave us the theme of human nature. So obviously we have this nature aspect integrated into the um, silhouette of a human, and you'll see that as we keep going, how she incorporates that into her work. Really unique thing that we, get, we do is we put it in the hands of the artists because th we should. Uh, they, they have that authority on the beauty of their work. So, move forward. Um, yeah, so I'm going to let Quinn take over talking to fiction, so let's welcome him. It's really a pleasure to be a part of um, the Alcala Review. I didn't envision myself going this route um, in college. I actually came in um, as a bio major, and um, I saw myself really heading down that road. And now I'm, I'm a senior now, and I'm graduating with a, an emphasis in creative writing. And I think, um, I honestly think beauty, and how I'm, I'll, I'll sort of discuss that in a second, um, really drew me to writing in a way, and um, it's, it brought me to where I am now, which is really an awesome experience. Like, I really can't explain that enough, um, how USD has brought me to this position of being able to work with writing, and now I see my future um, in a future where I can write. So I think a lot of that comes from the Alcala Review, and I'm grateful for that. Um, so also, I'm going to get to, I'm going to read off this in a moment, so if you are distracted, hold on for a second, but um, <laughs> I just want to talk about, this is a selection um, from Dominique Schenk, she'll be featured in the journal, she's a senior, fellow senior at USD, um, but so before I get to that, I want to mention sort of how I started to think about beauty um, in terms of fiction and nonfiction, um, and I sort of, I don't want to quantify beauty, I don't think that's um, fair, but I think in a sense of writing beauty is um, a measure of emotion in, in a way that certain emotions can be communicated in new and in different ways that aren't always seen um, maybe visually or um, audibly. So I think largely writing is a way of like grasping the world and being able to grasp um, elements of the world that you can't physically grasp. And so um, I think that if a piece of writing is done in a way that it's attractive and pleasurable for whoever's reading it, like that sort of establishes what a sense of beauty is to the piece. And I think it is subjective, but I also think it's a visceral reaction in a way. Um, 
that when you, when you realize you are reading something from a different perspective and it makes sense, that's really beautiful. Um, and it can open your, uh, you open your mind to a lot of different ideas um, of how to grapple with those sort of concepts in the future. And so I think that's where beauty can be found in writing. I think great authors see stories and events that happen in their lives and, um, and they describe it in a completely unique way that no one else could. And, and it's through that sort of um, specificity that also the beauty is erected. Um, you know, you don't always think that when you write a story, uh, someone's writing a story about their very personal relationship with a family member, that that could relate to your life in any way. Um, I mean, we all have family, but you know, there's specific, everyone has their own story. But I think that specificity bridges the gap and sort of allows um, readers to to sympathize and empathize with situations where they may not have realized they have the right to do so. So I really, um, that's sort of my way of discussing how beauty fits into writing. Um, but so now I want to briefly read from this um, section from Dominique Shank. I think I'm just going to read um, the last part there, but this comes at the end of her, short, uh, her essay. It's a nonfiction piece um, that will be in the journal. So this comes towards the end, and I think I'll touch on this in a second, but it's a good representation of sort of how maybe I was searching for this idea of beauty and like what I just discussed um, for this upcoming issue. And so I'll just read this. It's really beautiful. But I couldn't shake our family saying, I'd seen, it, I'd seen more of my family in a matter of months than I'd seen in years, but the circumstances of our meetings dampened the joy. I learned more about my grandparents from obituaries and stories after the fact than I ever did while they were living. And I realized that can't happen anymore. The problem I found in my research of the apocalypse was that catastrophe rarely galvanizes people. Fixation on death paralyzes people, prevents them from making a difference, even when it's possible. And so Dom wrote this really wonderful piece, um, and there's a lot going on. But I think, and now I'm going to sort of talk to the to nonfiction as a whole. I think the beauty in nonfiction comes um, to how one arranges their story. Um, and in this case, Dom, she there's a lot of um, intimate, personal, and familial issues that come up throughout the story. But she beautifully like interweaves this narrative of studying the apocalypse and how. Um, she drove through by the fires of, on, on the highway on the five when um, the fires were going just past semester. And she does this really beautiful way of tying that to that feeling of, um, of catastrophe and helplessness and tying it in a way that makes sense. And so, I mean, like anyone, when they, when they hear their grandparents die, they don't um, immediately start thinking of um, Parable of the Sour or like another parable where, like, I don't know, what I'm trying to get at is that Dom, I was, this stuck out to me because Dom saw this situation in her life as a unique, um, as a unique situation that she understood it as this. And I also thought that the apocalyptic nature of it kind of ties into our um, current um, situation like in society. Um, not to say that we're in an apocalypse, but there's a lot of fear and and galvanization. So this is sort of, I wanted to bring this up. Um, and that's just like, in terms of beauty and nonfiction, I think this really represents a sort of rearranging of thoughts and, um, and, uh, and authenticity that Dom um, exhibits here that's really beautiful. Um, and so briefly, I also, in my own personal writing, um, I'm more inclined towards fiction and um, I also, um, that's my emphasis, is in <coughs> fiction. And so I want to just briefly touch on um, an aspect of fiction, because we also have a, a lovely fiction section in the journal. And so fiction to me, I sort of, I thought about fiction um, very based on the narrative, because I think people in general um, expect a certain structure of a story, not necessarily a nonfiction story, but fiction because they want, I think I, I could sort of think of it as the, in the Freitag triangle structure, like people want that rise and then they want to be settled back 
down and have a new outlook. And so, yeah, fiction, people have this sort of expectation. And I think where the beauty in fiction comes is hugging that line of expectation, um, but also keeping it from fully going, like, uh, it's the term I'm referring to is like un the untidiness of fiction because that's, that Freitag's triangle is a beautiful way of creating tension and, and telling a story, and it's been done for, it's been proven, and it's been done for ages, but um, I think some of the formulas can be messed around with in fiction in a way that that tidiness is, is you can see it, but it's also, it misses it just a bit. Um, and, it's, and I also, that tidiness, untidiness speaks to sort of what I think is the beauty of fiction, and it's the moment um, in a story when you sort of realize that nothing's ever going to be the same again for the characters. Um, and if an author can express that in, in however many words is, is unbelievable because we're able to see, you know, the inner thoughts of, a, of someone and, and, it, and understand how they've changed. And so I really like to look for, like, in a fiction story, like, how am I, where am I, where do I know when the sense that nothing will ever be the same again. Like, where does that come up? And then again, like, how, how can we just make it a little bit untidy? And it's, it's purposeful, but it's also organic, because you don't want to just miss the, it head on. You want to be able to do it artistically. And so, yeah, I think overall beauty is, is difficult to discuss, and which is why we are coming to this room so many weeks in a row, but I think um, in a good way, like it's, it's, it's complicated and wonderful, so I think what I want to end with is um, in, my, in my own writing I really tried to be authentic and, and work from a place that what I really know, and I think when you do it from that vein, um, everything else follows in a way, and, and like in a, in a good way, like you if you start with being authentic and, and writing what you know, I know that's a common term that's thrown out a lot, but writing what you know is um, a good base for being able to communicate a sense of connection and, um, and a sense of beauty that otherwise would not be there. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. Uh, McKenna's going to touch on the poetry and translation aspects of this. So this journal is the first journal to have pieces in another language, so we chose some pieces of poetry in Spanish, and that was such a great experience, and it's so great that now as USD and as a community within San Diego as well, that we are expanding to the point to where we are, including other languages. Um, but to begin, I just want us to kind of ruminate on the idea of beauty and what beauty means to us. So just take a couple seconds and think if you can think of like a word or two that sums beauty up for you. So when Bree first told me that we were going to be doing a panel, that's exactly what I did, is I sat down and I thought, what is beauty? What does beauty mean to me? And what came up to, um, immediately just was kindness. And that kindness to me is what beauty is. Um, and it kind of touches on the goodness that Brie talked about, but it made me think, and it was like, well, if kindness is beauty, um, and then kindness can kind of alternate with altruism and that idea of always giving back, and there's the idea that perhaps altruism is inherently selfish. So what it, how does that all work if altruism is inherently selfish because you'll do these acts of good in order to um in order to make yourself look better appear better feel better um then what is beauty and that's as far as i got so <laughs> i was like i was trying to justify it to myself and i guess i just came to the conclusion that like altruism is still beneficial to others um and it's the closest thing that I think we can get to true beauty. Um, and in terms of like the literary journal, I thought, well, we are taking these works that people are putting their, their heart out and they're putting their work that is so close to them out for us to look at, for us to judge, for us to put together into a journal. And I thought, well, how, how does beauty relate to these works of primarily 
translation to begin with because that was what I really focused on this semester. And um, what I came down to is that beauty between two translations of English and Spanish work is a portion of it is accuracy. And the ability to have this meaning carried throughout throughout both languages within each piece and um, this consistency of themes of language, of vocabulary, and that consistency when you translate it to also be in the other language. And um, I remember working with, uh, I know working with the poet who wrote the pieces in Spanish was such a great experience because I'm reading through it. Um, a little background, I don't typically, um, I grew up going to a bilingual elementary and middle school, so I grew up speaking Spanish in school. Um, by no way would I consider myself fluent, but I definitely can read and write in Spanish. And so talking with her, it was like I would read this passage or this sentence and I'd be like, I know what you mean, but then in the translation piece, because she translated herself, I was like, it has this other meaning, and even with something as subtle as a punctuation, which is not even the same in um, English and Spanish, like to my dismay, there's no such thing as the Oxford comma in Spanish. And I was like, oh, there's an Oxford comma missing here. And she's like, that's not a thing. I was like, okay. So good to know. Um, and just like working with her to create this consistency, which is what I was like working on to create this beauty, was definitely difficult um, because there's some things in the world that are so beautiful and for me that is language and even languages that I did not initially begin when I was born um, as English and so there's words in Spanish like frío little and that means um, someone who is like constantly cold or who constantly experiences like these like frigid feelings of frigidness and there's no word for that in English so how does one manage once again this line between two languages which are almost like dissecting this idea of beauty and dissecting it into two different portions because of the two different languages. Um, and I just, working with that was such an experience and so, so something to like think about and um, wonder. And then I also began to, um, looking through the poetry and was thinking, how does beauty relate within these pieces? And so I began um, by looking through the pieces and I decided this was the first one I read when I was looking through the ones that'll be in the upcoming journal. And it was the first one that I thought, wow, I really want to discuss this one with you guys. So I'm going to go ahead and read it. It is called The Waves Break, They Break, and Galaxies Bring Me Back by Kate Imhoff. So, my toes in the sand, the sand, Tiny drops of stardust with stars and dust covered gal exceeds between my toes. How sleepy the waves make me shells scrape, they scrape. My skin burns with sunlight, light to drown out. Darkness of the ocean before me. The sand, the sand, it steadies me as I walk. Broken footsteps down a path, down on the shore with shells. Um, to begin, that is a hard piece to read aloud because <laughs> of like the different the line breakage, the punctuation. Um, but that is what adds so much beauty to this piece is the contribution that just a couple m dashes uh, slashes can add to the piece because you know the poet when she inserted those, there was so much meaning in that. Um, and for me, it, that punctuation, kind of that ebb and that flow that that brought into the piece reminded me of the ocean and like this rocking sense of how I read the poem and the breaks and how it was like the breaks of the waves where the breaks you can see in the piece of the punctuation. Um, and just this ebb of flow of language and how the beauty and vocabulary and what I said earlier about the something as beautiful as language being on the page and being something that as the Alcala Review, we work as a team, as a cohesive unit in order to create that and to um, share that with others is amazing. Um, and so I looked at both those aspects of the poetry this semester, and then I thought about, well, a common theme about in poetry is this theme of pain, 
whether it is subtle or whether, whether it is so prominent, there is this theme of pain in poetry. And I was thinking about, well, how can pain be beautiful? How is something that affects everyone and is so detrimental to the lives of so many people, but is so necessary, how, does, how is this pain beautiful? And then I thought about all the poetry that wouldn't exist if there wasn't pain and how pain can be beautiful because it can influence someone to create. And I would just like to leave off with that idea. So thank you so much for listening. There's a couple of things that AR does really beautifully, other than what my uh, friends just spoke to. Number one is teaching and learning. We uh, recently became, not recently, about a year ago, we became a one credit course and got overwhelming support from uh, the English department to enthusiastically teach um, undergraduate students, don't need to be English majors, um, the world of publishing. And since then we've developed a curriculum that we think is conducive towards um, figuring out exactly how the publishing world works, whether that be in you know, scholarly publishing or creative publishing or just copy editing or anything really. Um, we really do work hard to uh, read as much as possible um, more scholarly texts that speak to the evolution of literary print. And um, it's really just wonderful to uh, get a bunch of like-minded kids or young adults together um, who, who are interested in perpetuating print publishing. Um, I know that we're moving towards this digital humanities world, which is amazing and exciting and keeps uh, things having a more lasting existence, but you just really can't replace holding a physical journal. Um, so as the one credit course component, um, we've just had overwhelming support um, with people uh, even saying that they, they don't even want to take the course, they just want to sit in and audit and hang out and be part of what we're doing. Um, number two, the second thing that we do really beautifully is creating a community. Originally we were founded upon the principle of furthering or just creating a, a better, more supportive creative writing community on USD's campus. And um, with help from the English department, from Dr. Stoll and from uh, Carla Pettigrew and um, you know all the creative writing professors and such, we've had extremely successful events. We've had open mics where people just really get up there without abandon and share things. And I've had um, students come up to me afterwards and say, hey, are you the MC? I said, yeah. They go, that was fantastic. I've never been on a stage before. Did I hold the microphone right? Were people listening? Did, did I have food in my teeth? That was so invigorating. That was amazing. And it's, it's just cool like to have that sort of platform um, and cultivate those sorts of events that are still connected to creative writing, to publication, um, but have fun while doing it. Um, as far as like community and support, speaking to that, we have sold out every single semester. Now, whether that speaks to whether we need to print more journals or uh, figure out our economic situation or something, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, exactly, we're not raising the price. Our price actually went down significantly. Um, but we sell out every single semester. We have people knocking down the doors asking, how can I get a copy of this journal? Um, in the past semester, we, um, succumb to capitalistic enterprises and are now available on Amazon, which is huge. So, I mean, we're on Amazon Prime. So, um, it's that sort of, like, encouragement that reinforces, like, we are doing something that is important, you know? We are really um, doing, doing something that just, yeah, I'm just going to be repetitive. It's important what we're, what we're doing, uh, giving, giving students that platform because it is all exclusively USD photography, USD writers, USD uh, students printing and working so, so hard on this. The third thing, oh, I already said it. So that's the third thing that we do beautif beautifully is that creative writing matters. Um, the All Call Review has just worked so hard to keep writers and creators relevant in a society that you know, I mean, the, the movement of STEM is extremely important, but we can't forget about the people that are there to write and create and to also explain uh, eloquently exactly what is going on 
in the world. So, to close, we've given you the past, we gave you the present, and now the future. Um, we have our publication, our spring 2018 edition coming out in May. Our, it's going to be debuting Monday, May 9th. And we'll be in La Grande Terraza. Uh, the, the event itself is from 6 to 9, and we'll be reading from the new journal. You can purchase the new journal. And um, I want you all to just bear in mind, as like my final word, um, we've made a deliberate shift with AR to move from just a literary journal to a culture journal. We are starting to use that sort of language um, to describe ourselves as the on-campus culture journal. Um, it's, we're going beyond creative writing. We've started incorporating op-eds, reviews, editorials, translation works, essays, etc. Um, I think I was telling Dr. Hasselbeck right before this, um, Dr. Irene Williams once asked me while I was in class, uh, Bree, do you, do you uh, accept essays? This is about a year ago. Do you accept essays for um, publication that I'll call a review? I said, oh, no, we're, we're doing more creative writing, poetry, fiction, nonfiction. Um, she goes, how are essays not creative? <laughs> 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 so you're absolutely right. So we're accepting them at all. We're really um, expanding. Last semester, we had uh, two reviews from on-campus plays with huge support from the theater department. Um, this semester, we're excited that we're incorporating some artistic elements. The first 25 copies of the journal, pro probably 25, the first 25 copies of the new journal is going to have a blank uh, open page in the back. And we are working, collaborating with two art students from the art department who are going to create some sort of physical um, just component. I don't, know, I don't even know what they're doing yet. Some part to the journal that's going to be um, very like interactive and uh, just only make our journal more beautiful. So um, that's where we're moving. The future of AR is really bright. We are working harder and harder to be the pulse on campus for uh, culture and literary innovation. And I can't thank you all enough for your support. So thank you so much. Well, um, first of all, I just want to thank you all for being here today and contributing to, to this series. And also thank you more importantly for everything you've done on campus for the, the creative writing and for the love of language. Your dedication to this is really important. There are many of us who love the arts and humanities and always worry about it becoming eclipsed by narrowly vocational education, STEM, and all the things you were speaking about. <laughs> yeah, so thank you. You've really helped to bolster that. Um, I said a question for Quinn. It's an interesting point you made about untidiness. I like the theme of untidiness. It's one of the like, like uh, Bacon Stein somewhere. He said, what is ragged must be left ragged. And this could be applied, I think, to, to the human experience and how it's portrayed in, in literature. But uh, it's interesting to think about the juxtaposition between untidiness and how we sometimes think of beauty as something especially tidy. People think about our campus as being a beautiful place, <laughs> and if it was untidy, it wouldn't be called that. So, and again, if we go back to what Bert was talking about, in the like gardens, like beautifully manicured gardens, and the sort of things that are beautiful here. Can you just tell me a bit about where there's a tension between tidiness and untidiness in your conception of beauty? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I agree, beauty, um, in its, I guess, in the definition in its history is um, there are some terms you can blindly throw at it that people would sort of agree with in terms of like physical beauty. And so I guess where I would start to answer that question is um, I think what is, what's beautiful for me when I am writing um, is when sort of my original intent maybe shifts on its own and I'm, I'm forced to like catch up with that. And I think that that can only happen if, if you're truly um, being authentic, like I mentioned, and you're truly uh, giving yourself to the piece. And I think so in, in terms of tidiness, I don't think that like you could start out maybe for an idea of beauty that you wanted to get across in a, in a piece 
but I think there's going to be a, a period where that shifts, and then and your job is to then like ride with that that notion, and so sometimes that can lead you to, for me, like a, a different way of looking at beauty, and so I think the tidiness, um, I think it's a, a good thing to strive for, but I think the nature of writing is also like, you just can't, you couldn't, as long as you tried, get back to that tidy ending, and I think like specifically that is, is what's beautiful, is like how close you could get um, to where you began, but then everything is, 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 is actually different, like from that point forward. And I, I'm sort of dancing around like the specifics of your question, but I think the, t the tidiness um, that I like would expect in fiction uh, is always surpassed by like when I find something that just misses that. And I think that that's, there's no like way to describe like how that is, is done, but I think acknowledging that there isn't a sort of tidiness like from the beginning or that there's no eventual tidiness that that um, allows the the beauty to come out that was maybe unintentional. So yeah. Oh. Oh yeah. Um, I've never read the review, but just a question in terms of like content. Do you have a political section? We we have gotten political. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> both my pieces. <laughs> yeah, we've gotten political. So uh, we are like I was I was talking about before. We're just evolving to cre to culture. Yeah. yeah, to have more content. For about two years, we are exclusively fiction, nonfiction, poetry, um, and you know Cropper winners. Um, Cropper winners are published every fall, but in the spring we have a little bit more room to do more things. Um, so. Last semester, I don't know if this is particularly political, um, but McKenna wrote a piece about the drag show. And it was really beautiful because we all know that the drag show is controversial on campus and it's boycotted and every single year. Um, but the piece that she wrote, I'll say, was really, really beautiful. And uh, we got to interview some of the, or she, she interviewed some of the uh, people that were heavily involved in that. And then again, this semester, if you, check out the review. McKenna also wrote a piece um, that talks about uh, recycling and, do you wanna talk about it? Yeah, yeah, ahead. yeah. So the piece I wrote um, for last semester um, in terms of the drag show was like, of course not necessarily political, but of course political, especially when you bring, you know, events like that onto campus like Bree said. But um, for this semester, I actually, um, I wrote this piece, It's Oh, another sneak peek. You guys are lucky. Um, <laughs> so it's don't be trashy, going zero waste, because um, that is something I have really dedicated myself to this year in terms of composting. Um, there's lots of things I've done. Um, but for me, that contributes to be beauty in so many different ways. Um, there's the beauty of hopefully this influences people to look at our earth and look at the damage and the the sadness and the not beauty that we are contributing and how we can turn that back into a beauty and how we can take this goodness, this kindness, this beauty and um, try and help and save the earth for what is left of it. Um, but yeah, I would say that that wasn't necessarily political, um, but there's some political undertones in it. Yeah. Um, Hers, her piece, we were putting it under the like section of op-eds, um, and we encourage really any sort of, if you're going to submit to the All Call Review on our submittable, you probably submit it to other writing, um, but we don't, we don't shy away from a lot of things. Um, we don't like to sense, I mean, like one of our, journals has a bra on it. Like we, we're not in the business of censoring really anything. We're trying to embrace as, as much content as possible. So look, looking forward, we hope to definitely get more political on all spectrums. Thank you. First of all, thank you all so much for this. Say, you should be so proud of the journal. It's a stunning product every year. I look forward to it. But I had a question actually for all of you. If I'm not mistaken, you're all creative writers. So what are some influences, some 
um, writers who you admire influences it directly, indirectly on your own work? Who do you like to read? Who would you like to write like? Would you not like to write like? <laughs> Can I start? Yeah, go for it. All right. Um, in the creative writing emphasis, we're really lucky to be exposed to a wide breadth of writers um, and an in, in English major in general. Um, I've found that I've gravitated a lot to the New York School poets. I'm a poet myself. Um, the New York School poets, I love what Ginsburg does with the fluidity of his voice. Um, Dr. Black knows I have just a thing for Sylvia Plath. <laughs> um, I love her so much. Um, so that's who I strive to write towards. I also have been trying to get definitely more into contemporary work. I just went to a, a slam poetry show actually last week that Rudy Francisco was in attendance of. He's a local San Diego poet. He's, he hits hard. So um, yeah, that's what I like to do. Um, yeah, I, I, every day and every class period I have, I find someone else who I like, I'm like, oh, I really, want to be like them, <laughs> but I think recently um, I was sort of introduced to like fiction in like a realist sense, just like um, realist situations, but I, I'm really intrigued by like sort of magical realism. I'm not very like strong in that sense, but like that's a definite influence on me. Like, uh, I mean, Kelly Link and um, George Saunders, I actually just got to see both of them speak recently at a conference. And so those names are in my mind. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm sort of right now just, I'm loving the short story. Like I, I haven't read, I read, still reading novels of course, but I'm really in being influenced by like short stories still and that's exciting. Um, for me, in terms of kind of like the op-eds I've been creating, um, I would definitely say the beauty that humor brings and I think that would probably be a lot of it derived from Wallace because he does it in such a um, beautiful and such a tasteful way. Um, and then I would say in terms of poetry, it's funny that Bree mentioned Allen Ginsberg because that's what immediately just popped in my head, especially his like super, his supermarket piece because it's like, how is there beauty in a supermarket and then there, there's beauty there. Um, but recently, I also have been really enjoying Nick Flynn's work. Um, he's like a contemporary, contemporary poet. And his piece, I mean, one of my favorite poems is talking about these mice and these mice and these bags and they're burning. And just like that's so, um, that kind of agony, just like it really touches you and it makes you think and it really has like influenced a lot of my work in terms of how I create it. Yeah, uh, this question is somewhat related to Dr. Clark's, but this morning I had a chance to go to the UCSD and there was a Latvian poet who read this very wonderful poem, well, first in Russian, then was translated by somebody else. And it was about the, a, 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 a cat burglar. And this guy ran and took steel things. But he went into a room and where the man and the woman in the house were sleeping and they were whatever, they were, they were sleep talking. And when it went through the, went through the poem, it occurred to me like there was a relationship between the form and the content that was very interesting because it ended up that he was stealing in a way secrets that was deeper than confession. And I was saying, I kind of asked him, I said, it seems to me like this is something more intimate than certainly relating to somebody or even like relating as a priest to that deep confessional because this is really <coughs> unfiltered. And it became a kind of metaphor because like poetry, it seems to me, and I'm stressing particularly poetry, but creative writing in general, is something that you are actually asked to be a kind of thief to go in and snatch something intimate that in some way doesn't relinquish itself. And as a reader, you're asked to do that, and so you have a job to do to get away with this very intimate experience. Now, I, on the one hand, I would describe it as like, that's because poetry leaves these gaps in which unexplained, 
But the thing of you're a very good thief in that sense is that when you snatch the thing that allows it to speak, then in a sense, the surplus overflows into the world, right? And, and it's so it's kind of like, almost like the paradox of like nothing and it overflows into something else. And that to me, that overflowing is what opens the door to the beauty that will be in the future, because right now you don't recognize it, right? Right now it's just sort of overwhelming, like, well, it's silent. So I'm wondering what, what do you think about that relationship? I mean, it, it's a funny to say a poet is encouraging to be a thief. <laughs> but in a sense, that's kind of like what it needs to be in terms of language. Can I answer that? All right. So I should have spoke a little bit more about our submission process because it's extremely unique. Um, as a person, as a writer who submitted my works, to fence every single submission pro uh, submission window and gotten rejected every single time, I was kind of tired of that. Like you said, I'm uh, as a writer, you're you're taking something very very intimate and then casting it out into the world and letting it be judged. Um, when we go through our submission process, we everybody in the entire not just editors, everybody in the entire club gets to read. The works. Then when we select, um, we make sure that it's thoughtful, thorough, everybody gives nuances, everybody who wants to contribute gives uh, nuances and critical review to why they are choosing the selection that they are choosing. Then the editors like uh, Quinn and Katie Collins and Mary Brissett and McKenna of course um, will go and meet with the author and we have edits for them because we want to polish their work as much as possible. We think that this is unique to, um, different than any other journal really out there. Well, maybe some, but most journals out there because we have this unique setting of a very small campus. And so why not take the time, take the extra two weeks to go meet student to student like bring ourselves down a notch and say, hey, let's make your work absolutely beautiful and ready for publication before you know your confessions, like you said, your thievery is put into the world in perpetuity. So does that kind of speak a little bit? Yes. Yeah. All right. It's, it's, John Stuart Mill also says, just defines their poetry as always overhearing. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a, it's a nice way to think of when you read a lyric poem which doesn't have a narrative to it, so it doesn't give you, it's just voice talking. And there's always a feeling like you're actually overhearing, the, the voice isn't actually talking to you, you're overhearing. That's sort of a version um, commonly described of the fever you're talking about. Thank you. Um, I, yeah, I had a, a, a question, I guess, for you know, for all of you or anyone who's interested, connecting with your point about form and content being um, really intimately related, um, we've just had a breakthrough cultural moment in the United States with Kendrick Lamar winning the um, Pulitzer Prize for Music. And of course, a lot of what's going on there is poetry. So I'd be curious to hear your response to this. Um, I, I think it's a pretty amazing moment for all of us. Um, I would highly agree. I really think um, rap um, is a very accessible form of poetry. I think it's something that so many people, they consume on a daily basis and perhaps they don't consider it poetry, um, but maybe that is because of history or um, one thing or another. But for me, it's there's times where it's like this theme, I'll be writing my poetry, it's like, this would be better as a rap with that kind of beat and with these other um, additions. So. Um, I don't know if you guys want to also touch something on that, but yeah, I remember my first thought being, that's kind of odd, like, how is that groundbreaking? And then I thought about it and I was like, it's groundbreaking in the terms of the work that it is itself, it's groundbreaking in the terms of who Kendrick is as a person and how he um, functions within the Amer within the United States and um, our history and everything as well. I think it's encouraging as like 
again, breaking just another glass ceiling. Um, at one of our open mics, we had uh, a rapper open for us, and uh, he said, you, you guys are doing more than just reading poems, right? And we said, yeah, of course, you can absolutely go up there, and he just went unfiltered and did his thing, and we weren't gonna, you know, stop him or anything, but I think that the Pulitzer Prize, I mean, it's got its own controversy. There's been poets that have rejected it, philosophers that have rejected it before, but it still lets kids like us know, or young adults like us know that, it, that they're, the bounds are being broken, that you know we can consider there's more room for interpretation as to what is beautiful, what is art, what is lyric, etc. And I think in terms of form and content it's it's really exciting that it's it's strange i guess out of what mckenna is mentioning but it's exciting just to see um people in society get recognized for like the very artistic and thoughtful things they do that maybe wasn't thought of in a certain light before and i think in terms of like rap and like verses and, and music it's so like tied with the like younger I mean all, as it always is I think for the younger generations and so in the future I feel like this is it's definitely inspiring to a lot of young poets and um, and how they may go about producing a form that is in the future thought of as poetry or some something some variation of that. Any last questions? Okay, well, I'd like to join my voice to Breeze in thanking uh, the Humanity Center not only for hosting this event this afternoon, but also for its constant heart. Um, the Humanity Center is one of our primary benefactors that enables this work and the production of the beautiful journals that were distributed earlier, which I'm going to have to collect. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's been a great pleasure. And um, yeah, please thank Carl.